Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Oh, I'm booming at the back. Daniel, can you hear me okay? Am I drowning everyone? <laughs> yeah. Mads will turn me down. So well done. First up, you made it after the bar last night. I'm guessing quite a few of you here uh, would have come on uh, an airplane or a flying doctor of some description. So I wanted to tell you a real true story. I have a bit of a phobia of flying, not because of the flying, because I've had 12. Is there a doctor on board call? Any of you have one of those? Yeah, quite a few of you. So I was transatlantic and the call went out, is there a doctor on board? And I was like, oh God, I'm quite drunk actually. I've had like four of those little balls. And I went up and there was this 80 year old guy kind of lying there. I was like, oh man. And British Airways are really good. They have all the resuscitation equipment and we tried quite hard and his wife came up and she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, Doc, it's okay. He, he's 85, he has cancer. Uh, we've just coming back from Paris. I think you should stop. I said, okay. And everyone was quite quiet. And the same stewardess then grabbed the PA system. If there's a priest on board, can he please make himself known? <laughs> And I kind of walked back to my seat like this. I was like, oh man. So this is not what I'm going to talk to you about today. John, who died on the plane, died of a natural expected death. What I'm going to talk to you about today is how to survive a cardiac arrest. I've got quite a bit of experience of this in the UK from working on various air ambulances, but what I'm gonna focus on is our work in Scotland and how we changed a country. And I want to try and give each and every one of you some tips and plant some seeds that I want you to leave this conference with and go home and answer. And as you heard about yesterday, one of the great resuscitation legends was Peter Saffer. And Peter coined the term resuscitationist. And by definition, you are all resuscitationists. You're all here. You all got out of your bed to listen to this lecture, okay? And I want you to take some responsibility for where you live and your survival. And the first thing to say is we need to change our mindset around death. It's not just this one moment in time. It's a window of opportunity that you have to save your patient. Now you're gonna hear some really cool stuff later from Zach and Lionel about how to make this window really big with ECMO, like days long. But I wanna show you how the first bit of the chain of survival is, is the most important. Now I went to Scotland, it's really true, you can get deep fried Mars bars in restaurants. And this is really great for me because as a cardiac arrest researcher, we have loads of cardiac arrests because people eat a lot of this. And what I'm going to tell you about is the most common, the most acute, the most full-on life-threatening emergency. This is more common than major trauma. This is way more common than all the stuff we talk about on conferences. And yet, we just don't give it enough attention. And I'm going to follow one patient through and give you really specific examples. So Kev is a typical Scottish guy. He drinks whiskey. He has too many cigarettes. He eats fish and chips on a Friday night. And he has a cardiac arrest in a casino. Now, when we started this work, Kev's chances of surviving were terrible. And I mean terrible. Look at this. The yellow line is the ROSC rate, and the red line is the survival to discharge rate over 15 years in southeast Scotland. What do you see? Two things. One, the lines were going in the wrong direction. This point here was the day the Scottish government put a paramedic on every single ambulance. This was the day we decided to intubate everyone and get everyone drugs. Look what it did to our survival. And look what happened to survival to discharge. 0.7%. Okay, 0.7%. What is the data from your region? Do you know what your graph looks like? The answer is probably no. You need to understand what your survival to discharge rate. ROSC is not good enough. 
And we had a complete system failure, actually. We didn't realize it. We didn't know that patients like Kev were dying all the time. So it was completely no surprise when I went to my boss and I said, I want to do some cardiac arrest research. And they said, why do you want to do that? All the cardiac arrest patients, they just die anyway. Many of the hospitals that you take patients to, they just all die. They're not used to having a survivor, okay? We have to have a mindset shift that these patients don't need to die. And we were living in this like twilight world. If you don't ask the questions, you won't get any better. You will just continue. We would have been bumbling along less than 1%. So you all have a choice. You can take the blue pill and just keep doing what you're doing and nothing much will change. Or you can kind of be really daring and take the red pill, okay? Go for the Red Bull approach and say, hey, I'm going to ask some difficult questions. I'm going to piss some people off and I'm going to start to make things better. So firstly, cardiac arrest survival is really variable. So this is data from the UK. It doesn't matter where. The orange bars are ROSC and the blue is survival to discharge. What's the take home? The take home is that if you live in one place, your chance of surviving might be twice as high as someone else. Think about your country. If you said in Copenhagen, your chances of surviving breast cancer were twice as high as Stockholm. There'd be kind of someone would have something to say about that. But cardiac arrest just isn't really on that profile. So we decided to take the red pill. About six, seven years ago, we said, right, we're going to do something about this. And of course, to improve survival from cardiac arrest takes a lot of a lot of bullets, a lot of guns. It's like phew, machine gun. You can't, there's no magic bullet. There's no one thing you can do. And you know the answer to improving survival, the chain of survival, and you've seen that many times. But the chain of survival should look like this because you need to go from one rung to the next quickly, succinctly, without dropping this baton. If you're the UK team, you're fucked. Why? Because every Olympics, we drop the baton every single time. Okay, you need the Jamaican style. But what I'd also like you to take away is the chain of survival probably should like this. Because the first few rungs are way more important than the later ones. I'm really sorry, Lionel. I'm really sorry, Jack. All right, the ECMO thing right at the bottom is really, really cool. But unless you get the first bit right, you may as well not bother, okay? Because if you don't have good bystander CPR, if you don't have early defibrillation, everything else is going to be a waste of time. And I think we need to remember that, and we have to focus our efforts on the beginning of the chain. So how did we do this? How did we start to tackle some of the not so cool, not so sexy, but crucially important elements? CPR is very easy. Kev's chances of surviving his cardiac arrest are 1 in 5 if he gets CPR and 1 in 20 if he doesn't. He has to get bystander CPR. And I think the best example of this is Denmark. If you haven't read Wissensberg's paper, put it on your homework list to read when you get home. Because this is how they changed a country with CPR. So what did the Danish guys do? Well, this was their, their survival rate, 3.5%, not dissimilar to ours. You can see raising over 10 years to 10%. And look, what happened? The bystander CPR was just following it. Okay? What did they do? They trained a lot of people. They gave home CPR kits. They made it mandatory to have a CPR test as part of your driver's license. Crucially, they made CPR mandatory in schools. Why is Seattle so good? Because everyone in Seattle knows CPR. We have to start investing in these guys so that in 10, 15 years' time, your whole population of your town will know it. We've kind of got to get cool with it. How do we make CPR appeal to the masses? See if My name is Vinnie Jones, and I'm going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. 
There are times in life when being tough comes in handy. Say some geezer collapses in front of you. What do you do? We need a volunteer that ain't breathing. Here's one I made earlier. First thing you do is you check him over. If he ain't responsive or he ain't breathing, or he's making noises like this, then his heart will stop working, he's having a cardiac arrest. Look lively. First call 999. Then you do hands-only CPR and no kissing. You only kiss your missus on the lips. Watch. Okay. That went out on national TV. It's appealing, it's cool, it's funky. People are going to learn CPR or have a go at CPR because of this. We have to embrace technology. Things like the Good Sam app is now live across the UK in many cities. This is London yesterday with all the people that we can notify by mobile phone integrated in the ambulance dispatch system to run to Kev and do CPR. And all our ACT public access defibs are part of that. We need to embrace technology. The technology exists. This whole question, is it agonal? Are they in cardiac arrest? Are they not? What's happening with this guy is this is just a normal video. The one on the right is amplified, so there's a bit of movement. Or the other way you can do this is just look at the pixels. As the video is taking the video, the pixels are going around his face. And actually, we can just get his heart rate off that. Don't rely on a bystander to work out, are they breathing, are they not? We need to embrace this technology that says, you know what? Just put your iPhone on his chest, and it will tell me his ECG rhythm. All this technology exists, and we need to start embracing it. Clearly, defibrillation and public access defibrillation is crucial. This just shows you if you have no defib, Kev's chance of survival about 5%, right up to if he's defibrillated in three to five minutes, chances of surviving are three quarters. So what we did in Scotland is we said we need information, and you need information. You need to know everything about your region, your ambulance response times. Where does CPR get done? Where does it not? Where do patients get defibrillated? Where do they not? So this map of central Scotland, we knew every single cardiac arrest, and we knew everything about them, and that us allowed to put targeted areas. Now, what happens if you live you know, up on an island in Scotland or in a really remote region when there is no ambulance? Again, we need to start thinking about how we can embrace some of the technology that is already there. So we're speaking to our colleagues in the drone industry. Cover his torso. Uh, okay. Great. Can you go to the nearest exit? The ambulance drone is almost there. Okay. I'm outside. I'll be talking through the drone now, so you can put down the phone. Now please pick up the drone. To, to deliver drones and defibs very quickly. The technology is there. In the next five years, this will be routine. But I would take CPR one step further. We talk about it. Is it there, is it not? Well, that's not good enough, especially for your EMS. You need to know that your EMS crews are doing the right CPR at the right rate, at the right depth, all the time. And probably the biggest intervention we did was to introduce defibrillator downloads. So every single cardiac arrest resuscitation case, we pull off the data, so each red bar is one chest compression. So you can see minute zero, minute one, minute two, no CPR for a few minutes. Very patchy. Look at the CPR rate, 195. Like the Duracell bunny on cocaine or something. All right, Completely ineffective CPR. I can look at that and say that patient will die because the CPR is crap. Okay, But we wouldn't know that unless you'd done the defibrillator download. So the biggest thing we did was to start giving this information back to our ambulance crews. After every case, they get a nice letter saying, good job, but with that information. And that, if you ask me what one thing made a really big difference, this made a really big difference. But when you come to Kev, when you suddenly are faced with a very stressful situation, like being shot at in an F-16, you don't suddenly get better, okay? 
you don't suddenly rise to the occasion. And most paramedics in a big city will only see three, four, five cardiac arrests per year. You will fall to the level of your training. So an F-16 pilot will train to 130% of his ability. So when he's being shot at, he will fall to a safe level. All right? And this is exactly the same for us. Okay, we need to make sure on the day of the race we are ready. And another thing we're really bad at in medicine is working and training in teams. These guys can change the Formula One tire in 1.6 seconds or something. Why? Because they train it, they train it, they train it. What happens if they fuck up? Well, if they fuck up, it goes, you know, boom, all right? If we screw up, the patient will die. Kev will die. One drop in the chain of survival, the patient will die. It's the same as this. This guy survived. Okay? And actually, the Norwegians are pretty good at this. When I was there, this is the same. This is a pit crew resuscitation. A lot of people all working around. They have a team leader. They have an approach. So my mantra to you, if you work in a team, you need to train in the team. Not just your little team on your air ambulance or on base. The whole team. How often do you train with the regular paramedics? How often do you train with your dispatchers and feed back to them? We need to include the wider team. And this is the kind of approach we took. So we took a group in Edinburgh of people that were enthusiastic about cardiac arrest. And we said, OK, we're going to do something about this. So what did we do? We started bribing paramedics with donuts, literally. To come in on their day off, we said, hey, we'll give you free food to come and learn about resuscitation science so they understand about the science. We gave them as much training as they want. We trained in every possible way and gave them free access to simulation training. We put on some big master classes and education sessions and made cardiac arrest cool, okay? And made it, got in some survivors. Get in your survivors and show them that they don't all need to die anyway. But there was one step missing, I think, and this is really important, that you can do your education, you can get your data, you can get your CPR data, you can feedback, but leadership in resuscitation is really important. If you're seeing four or five cardiac arrests per year, it's very difficult to run that scene effectively. So we introduced one car that would go to all the cardiac arrests. It's just a paramedic, not a physician. And the role of this car was to provide some leadership. And that was really effective. And it allowed us to start making more difficult decisions. So one decision you might sort of think about is mechanical CPR. You may be pro or con. But we thought quite hard about, do we bring CPR into our system? If I show you this clip. OK. It's pretty clear that CPR in a moving ambulance is a complete and utter waste of time. Total waste of time. Not only that, it's very, very dangerous for this rescuer. But as you're going to hear about from Zach and Lionel later, you might have to move a patient. And some patients are not going to get better without something that the hospital can do. And we changed our mindset around this. So instead of having standard CPR and then crap CPR during extrication and kind of not so crap CPR in the ambulance, we said we want good CPR the whole time. Okay? And why did we want good CPR the whole time? We wanted to be able to take patients for ECMO. So the guy at the top is our 3RU cardiac arrest paramedic who's leading. The guys on the right just do their basics. And he's introducing the mechanical CPR device. And look at the clock on the bottom right. We're getting down the stairs, yeah? We'll get a bit standard health as well. And... So what we've got rid of is stay and play or scoop and run. We don't want to do either, OK? What we want to do is do really good resuscitation at the same time as moving the patient towards the hospital. 
And there's no reason you can't do this. So at like 20 minutes, where would you rather be? Would you still rather be on the floor in the casino where Kev's had his cardiac arrest with very limited options? Or would you rather, having done the same quality resuscitation, be in the ER when you can call the guys to do ECMO, you can think about organ donation, you might do some thrombectomy or whatever, okay? Gives you much more in the way of options. And finally then, what else did we do to take things to the next level? This afternoon, many of you will strap your GoPros on and go heli skiing and whizzing around. Because the only way you can know what is going on out in the field is with a video. Now, I would urge you not to put your GoPro and go and film a cardiac arrest because there's all sorts of problems with that around patient confidentiality and da da da. But what we did is we introduced this secure video badge. So it's kind of like a GoPro, but it's completely encrypted. So if we lose this badge on the floor, no one can get the data. And it's very carefully locked down. So every time one of our 3RU paramedics goes out, they've got a badge on. So we want to know how they lead the resus. We want to know how communication works. We want to know everything about it so we can make it better. So for example, I'm going to show you the real clip of Kev in the casino just had his cardiac arrest, okay? And see you the value of having video recorded. And you can see how we can start to understand real detail around the pre-hospital scene that as physicians and overseers of the EMS, we might never otherwise get insight into. So Kev is still, he gets a ROSC, and he's being transported to hospital now and see what happens, all right? And actually, Kev goes back into arrest and arrives in the ER in cardiac arrest and is exactly the ECMO candidate we would look for because he's a witnessed VF, he's had good bystander CPR, we know he's having a STEMI, and now he's in refractory VF. So I guess, guys, to kind of start summing up, this is what the British cycling team did really, really well and coined this term, aggregation of marginal gains. What did that mean? It meant that the British cycling coach realized that if his athletes had a better pillow, they would sleep a little bit better. If they had the slightly better diet, their performance would go up by like 0.001%. He even let their wives and girlfriends stay with them the nights before the race. So on the morning, they weren't like completely horny, crazy things. And all these little things added up together to give a 1%, 2% um, improvement margin. And this is the same for cardiac arrest. There's no magical solution, but by doing lots of little things, you can make quite a big difference. And this is the difference we made. So remember our survival in around Edinburgh of being less than 1%. For VFVT, it now sits at over 50. For all rhythms, it's about 22. But interestingly, it doesn't matter about the regions, but this was our region in red. Double other regions. You were twice as likely to survive a cardiac arrest in Edinburgh as you were in Glasgow. Twice as likely in Bern versus Zurich. Twice as likely Copenhagen, Stockholm. And that is what gets the attention of the politicians. The politicians do not like seeing graphs like this. So we had two options. What could we do? We could go to the press and say, hey, boof, this isn't good. Or we could work with the politicians to change the whole country. And that's exactly what we did. We went to the politicians and we said, guys, we need to do better. And they completely got it because they understood that lots of people were dying when they needn't. And we've introduced this Save a Life for Scotland campaign. We have a national strategy. I think one of the only countries in the world that has a national government strategy for out of hospital cardiac arrest where we're looking at everything I've described, not 
down in the weeds, but the government is driving it. And that is what is making things much, much easier. Because to get half a million people trained in CPR, you need it on the school curriculum. You need the driving tests. You need it on TV. It's a much more government level thing. And when things like this work, patients like Kev, who looked pretty dead in the video, didn't he? He looked really quite dead. Come back and say, hey, thanks. So my take home message to you would be to look at your chain of survival in your region. Does your school train in CPR? And if not, go in on a Saturday and train the guys, train the gym instructor so he can keep doing it. Overall, ABC is in, not airway breathing circulation. You have to audit what you do and understand all of the data, including survival to discharge. You need to get your basics absolutely right and then only then do the clever stuff. Don't start with mechanical CPR or ECMO. Sorry, guys. Start at the beginning. Audit, basics, clever stuff in that order. Have a look at your own system. Take the red pill, and then lots more patients will survive. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention.